Hello, everyone. My name is Melanie Junkins, and I work in the Office of School and Student Supports. This webinar is about the path for a 660 certification, um, otherwise known as English to Speakers of Other Languages. Here at the department, we recognize the increased demand for 660 certificate specialists in Maine. And this one hour webinar is designed for administrators and educators in the state who want to learn more about obtaining a 660 certification. The differences in emergency, conditional and full certification and a pathway to earn the certification at the University of Southern Maine. I wanna introduce you to my colleagues. This is Jane Armstrong. She's our ESOL specialist. Erin Reinhart is our certification coordinator, and I'm Melanie Jenkins, Family Engagement and Culturally Responsive Practices. At the University of Southern Maine, we have the Chair of the Department of Literacy, Language, and Culture, Dr. Melinda Butler with us, as well as the Associate Dean um, for the School of Education and Human Development, as well as Professor in the Department of Literacy, Language, and Culture, Dr. Andrea Stairs Davenport. We're so thankful that you could all be with us today. Our agenda today is next to hear from Jane Armstrong on why ESOL is a high needs specialty. Then hear from Maine DOE certification differences from Erin Reinhardt. We'll learn about one pathway for a 660 certification with the University of Southern Maine. And then we'll leave time at the end for questions and answers. Please hold your questions until the end. At the end, we will share the contacts with the Maine DOE staff and the University of Southern Maine. We'll also be sharing a feedback form that you can populate any questions for those departments and I will forward those um, questions to the appropriate people. On the call today, we have over 100 registrants and about 30 that couldn't make this call. We have SAU administrators, human resources, curriculum directors, superintendents, educators, paraprofessionals, pre-service educators, consultants. We have representation from over 35 districts across the state. And you can see from this map, the blue pins are those that are joining us on call. And the yellow are just a fraction of those that were unable to attend today. So first we're gonna hear from our main DOE specialist, Jane Armstrong. Hi, welcome everyone. It's really nice to um, see names pop up and some faces. So um, I am new in this role and started in August. And prior to that was an ESOL teacher um, and ESOL administrator in Portland Public Schools. So really excited to have you all here and to model this collaboration with um, folks from the certification office at DOE, Melanie, and uh, professors at USM to look at our pathways. Um, so this is not new to most of you on this call. We're really excited to be really centering this work, but really on this slide, what we really wanna show, and this is a infographic that was created um, by April Perkins and Robin Fleck and Rebecca Carey, who preceded me and did incredibly deep work um, to really leverage the, the the rights, the legal rights that we all have to ensure that multilingual learners are able to be identified and have services and staffing, the equitable access, the integration, special education, um, exiting the monitoring, meaningful opt-out, program evaluation, and communication with families. So that's a lot of information there, but what I really like is that within this, it's really it's really um, anchored by the Dear Colleague letter. And if you're not familiar with that, all of that is hyperlinked in the slide deck, but really it roots us in what is the law and the civil rights of our multilingual students. So today we're gonna really focus on services and staffing. And, um, and as most of you know, um, our main SAUs are required to have a board approved LAO plan. Um, that is really outlines how you're going to enact and uphold the civil rights of our multilingual learners and their families, really predicated on that civil rights title six from 1964. So all of those pieces on that infographic um, are, the, are a part of that. But what we really wanted to get into today was qualified ESOL endorsed staff. What does that mean? How can we ensure that we have people applying and have the competencies and if we don't have that, like, what are the pathways toward that? And that's what we really wanted to bring forth today. I also wanted to call your attention to an incredible resource um, at the MDOE Multilingual Data Dashboard. Um, it's an interactive dashboard where we're able to really look at 
how many multilingual learners we have in the state, geographically where they are, language um, groups, uh, change rate of change from last year to this year, and there's also historical context for that data. So I just really encourage you all to reference that if you are curious about your own district or you wanna see regional trends. One of the things that I have been able to do um, is really look at the trends. And so one thing that's really important to look at is that we do have an increase in student count. Um, we know it, we feel it, but really it's important to have the data and to really drill down into what does that data mean? So we do have a sizable increase in our pre-K through 12 from 22 to 23. What I find really interesting in, in the short amount of time in this role is just the inquiries from areas in our state that historically have not had multilingual students and families enrolling in their schools. So of the 266 SAUs in our, in our state, um, 50, over 50%, and again, this is data that it could easily be outdated in this moment and in real time, but it's over 50% have multilingual students and families enrolled. And of that 50%, 82% um, of that of those districts have less than 50 multilingual students and families. So really all to say that we are seeing a regional change um, across the state. And um, so not to discount those high incident areas that in districts that have really robust programming over, over periods of time, but also to recognize that we are seeing a need to um, at the state level support districts and, and those staff working toward a 660 um, to what does that mean? So um, that was the piece that we wanted to just set the foundation there and please be sure to access those resources. Um, these are available to you uh, in this slide deck. The other piece that we wanted to highlight was a real-time example. We have many, but this was really exciting. Um, in a very short period of time, this was um, an SAU up in Limestone Community School principal. Um, Melanie did a great job of, of really highlighting uh, this example and calling out something that we want to see um, you know, replicated in terms of what do we do when we need more ESOL, ESOL uh, teachers in our area, but we're unable to necessarily find those teachers or we want to be able to advance their own education. What are those pathways? What do they look like? So in this quote, um, Ben Ben really spoke to this and just said he were, we were struggling to find a qualified um, uh, regular education teachers, much, much less specialized in this ESOL work. In the past, you know, I've had to grow my own. And so this idea of like, how do we do that? And so with the help of the DOE and their, um, their staff and their willingness to think um, outside the box, they were like, let's let's talk about as a group of um, teachers who might want to be in this emergency certified um, status. And there were many. Um, and so together they worked with staff to identify those um, individual teachers and then to basically create some pathways. And so they're enrolled already in a course. And now they are in an they have an emergency certification as teacher, and they're on a path toward being sure that they are able to uphold those legal rights that we spoke about um, prior. So this is just one example, but oftentimes we don't see those little micro examples of how people are making a difference. And this was one that we wanted to highlight. Thank you, Jane. I'm gonna turn it over now to Erin Reinhardt, who is our certification coordinator. And for those of you just joining in, uh, we are just reviewing a little bit of what the ESOL need was. So we are gonna move into certification and then our friends at the University of Southern Maine are going to talk about a pathway um, for 660 certification. So Erin. Hello, everybody. So when giving this presentation, I first like to let people know a little bit about our office so they have a better idea. So we typically have five specialists answering the phone. They're not, or in the cert box, they're not answering all at once. So that's why there might be some wait times. Um, but we typically have five office specialists with the phone. We have about three certification specialists who analyze all applications against the laws and one who's specifically does backgrounds. Right now we're a little short as I've moved into this position. So I'm kind of 
both the coordinator and still an evaluator, but we are getting additional people. And then the team is overall supported by me. I'm the new team certification coordinator and our new director, uh, Michael Perry. So he also does higher ed and mentoring within the school district. So I'm sure people will hear of him. So that's kind of a general overview of our office. Um, I wanted to go over common questions first, because these are questions we kind of get the most, especially in the ESOL endorsement, um, the old rule versus new rule. Um, so if you're renewing a requirement and you've started, like if you're renewing an emergency or a conditional and you started before June 2022, you will stay under old law. We never move applications to new law unless we receive a specific request. And old law does have a few less requirements course wise, but does have potentially additional praxis requirements. So our biggest um, recommendation is the letter you received, if you've already applied, is the letter you go by unless you contact our office and we send out an updated letter. Um, if you haven't applied yet, you'd go by the current chapter 115, which I will go over. Fingerprint wait times. We recommend um, everybody get fingerprints as soon as they start applying because sometimes they can take a while, especially if you're out of state, it does take longer. And our typical processing time is three to four weeks. We're pretty consistent about that. Um, the only time it's a little longer is over the summer when we get the bulk of our applications for renewal. So the first step, I want to kind of go over the two pathways that we typically see for certification and some of the items about them. So the first pathway would be the pathway two. With this would be a non-approved program, but you have a bachelor's degree. So in new law, it does require that you have the new grade spans to be able to go under this pathway two, which has lower ESOL requirements. And that has been a big confusion amongst the field because in the past it didn't it wasn't specific to which grade span you need, and now it's very specific. You need the new law grade spans. But I will say most educators who, let's say you have a social studies 7 through 12, and you want an ESOL credential and you want the lower requirements to go through this pathway, we recommend just applying for social studies 6 through 12. I would say majority of the people would have, if you're already getting an ESOL certificate, would have already met the requirements because the big difference is the um, diversity coursework and most educators have already taken one ESOL course so that would count as a diversity course um then for the pathway two which is slightly lower because you already have a teaching credential it requires um 15 semester hours in ESOL but nine of them are specific types of courses so you need we you need a specific linguistics course a specific curriculum and assessment for esol and a specific methods teaching methods for esol and then the other six semester hours can be just any general esol related coursework you also need a minimum of three semester hours in a diversity course now we do know that diversity and esol because um, they're both cultural diversity courses, are very similar. So we've been working on rephrasing it to effectively need 18 semester hours in ESOL because you will need an additional diversity course, and we can't count courses twice on an application. Um, and then the next course would be the human development course. And many people already, most people do take this in the other undergrad. We don't find it's a huge amount of people we're requesting take it, as it is typical course for um a teacher taking their undergrad. And then last, all our all our endorsements require teaching students in the uh, teaching students with the exceptionality. And if you are going through this pathway, you would have already taken it to receive your first credential. So that's kind of the most common pathway. And then this is the other pathway that if you don't already have a teaching credential and you just want to get you want to start in ESOL, so it has a little bit additional um, requirements than pathway two. So this is again, bachelor's degree. Um, instead, this time you'll need 24 semester hours, which is common for most of our endorsements that you need 24 semester hours in that specific content. Um, the additional requirement with this one, maybe a little different than others, is you'll also need three semester hours in linguistics. Again, three semester hours in um, curriculum and assessment for ESOL and three semester hours in teaching methods in ESOL. But then the rest of the courses can be whatever ESOL courses you may be interested. We always recommend, of course, um, educators are unsure 
about a course if it will count or not, they can email us and our email address is cert.doe at main.gov. It is later on in the presentation under our contact information. We love to hear from educators to help them. We can walk you through the process, pre-approved courses if that you're interested in that. Um, we do try to recommend some locations, but we don't, we're not very specific. We're kind of just general um, locations that we do know offer courses. Then you will also need another, the diversity course, um, a human development course, the exceptionalities. And then you'll also need the Praxis one, but if you have a 3.0 GPA on all the required courses for this certification, you will not need to take the Praxis. Or if you complete a successful portfolio review demonstrating the competencies and main initial teacher standards. I would say 98% of people get a 3.0 GPA. So far, we've only received one portfolio. So if you are worrying about that, I would definitely wait until you complete all coursework as most people do get the GPA. And then last but not least is student teaching. Most people do their student teaching if it's the first time they're moving to a credential under a conditional for a year or two working in that position because then that can waive needing student teaching on a specific transcript. I know that was... I covered a lot of information, but one thing I also wanted to cover is just the different types of credentials because we have some new ones that people are seeing, especially at ESOL where we see a lot of emergencies. So I'm just gonna go over quickly the type of credentials we have. Um, so we have a professional credential, which is our standard five-year credential, meaning you've met all requirements. We now have a reciprocity professional. This is a five-year credential as well, a reciprocity professional credential. This is a five-year credential. You receive it based off having a credential, this comparable credential in another state. So you didn't necessarily go through Maine's laws. You went through another state's laws and that you received a reciprocity professional credential. And then we have conditional credentials, which is, this is a three-year conditional. And there's uh, three pathways you can get to receive a conditional. And the conditional is so you can start teaching while you continue to earn, um, meet the requirements, but that you, so you're already in a school, you already have a support system and you're not necessarily working on your own. So the transitional pathway is you already have a teaching credential and you have nine semester hours in ESOL, then you'd be eligible for the three-year conditional. Um, a standard conditional, this is if you don't already have a teaching credential, you would need 24 semester hours in ESOL, and then you'd be eligible for the three-year conditional under a standard conditional pathway. And then the third is if ESOL, which it currently does, falls on our shortage report, on the federal shortage report, you can be eligible for a conditional with nine semester hours and at least a bachelor's degree. So all of them do require you to have at least a bachelor's degree, but instead of going for the 24 semester hours, if it's the first time you're entering the education field, you only need nine semester hours um, to be eligible for the conditional. And the last, which is our biggest conversation we have about a lot of these um, newer credentials is the emergency. This is a one-year credential that's, bis that's issued based off the pathways and it is, re you are eligible to receive emergency credentials three times total in your lifetime. So if you own have at least a bachelor's degree or you're enrolled in an approved program or you hold um, an EdTech 3 credential in our office, you could be eligible for a one-year emergency credential to be teaching ESOL in the classroom. So those are different types of credentials. Great. And then I'm going to go over some tips and tricks. I know this is a fast, quick certification overview. Um, all transcripts to be, do need to be official. We see a lot of people apply and submit no transcripts. So you kind of wait the three to four weeks and then we send you a letter saying, hey, we still need your transcripts. So we like to be, we like to encourage educators to submit them with their application or shortly after. So you don't have to wait multiple timeframes. Um, we also recommend fingerprints are done before we evaluate, just so you don't have to wait for us to receive them. If you are applying and you went to an international school, your transcripts will need to be evaluated by a NASIS approved member. That can take some time, but it's a pretty easy process. Um, again, any course questions or approvals can be emailed to sir.due.main.gov. Um, just a reminder, if you're emailing multiple people and calling multiple times, that can kind of slow down all the response processes. Um, we get a lot of emails, and if you've emailed three or four times to multiple people, it kind of takes us a second to connect with everybody 
and it will slow down the response to an email where if you email once, it'll immediately or within a reasonable time frame be sent to the person who needs to respond and they'll respond. Um, so that's just a little reminder we like to let educators know. And we are here to help. Um, I know this was fast and quick overview. Um, I know we're saving questions for the end, but definitely I encourage you to send any questions you may have for certification. We genuinely want to help each educator make it through the process. And again, as it says in the top, we are here to help. Thank you, Erin, so much. For those of you that might have joined a little bit into her presentation, our feedback forum will have a spot for you to direct questions directly towards the certification team or the ESOL specialist or the University of Southern Maine. Um, and so, and then we will also stay on the call after this um, for any general questions that you have. So I'm gonna turn it right now over to my colleagues at the University of Southern Maine. Thank you so much, Melanie. It's great to be here today with everybody. I see some familiar names and faces, and I hope one day I'll get to meet all of the rest of you who I don't know already. I'm Andrea Stairs Davenport, Associate Dean and Professor in the department, and I'm gonna start with this first slide and then hand it off to Dr. Mindy Butler, who's our department chair. Uh, we've been doing this work at USM for several decades. And we have a really great cadre of full-time faculty and part-time faculty who have experience as ESOL teachers. Um, many of our part-time faculty are still, are currently teaching in the field. So they bring real life experiences and dilemmas of practice to conversations and courses. But we're very proud that we've been um, doing this program since 1990 when it was a concentration under our literacy education master's degree but um, we changed the name to TESOL back in 2014. And we've been fully online long before COVID. So that's one way that we can certainly serve you wherever you might live in the state of Maine. Um, I will say our graduate students are really incredible. We have a strong group of students who are collaborative, um, who learn a lot from one another. We have, um, people from all corners of the state and actually all corners of the world since we are fully online. And it's been, it's we really built a strong graduate student community and we would love to welcome some of you into it. Mindy. Hi there, uh, my name is Mindy Butler, as you know, um, and I am have been uh, teaching at USM since 2018 and I uh, just love it. And I completely agree with Andrea. Our graduate students are just amazing. So <clears throat> uh, we're so happy to be here today and just wanted to organize this information based on the EDU 660 certification. So for pathway one, um, that's our master's degree program and that's our initial teacher certification It's 39 credits. Um, and so that's a degree, Master of Science in Education and te Teaching English to Speakers of Other Languages. And that's a pre-K-12 ESL certification, which does include student teaching. Uh, so uh, Melanie, if you want to go to that next slide. And then so for pathway two, that's the endorsement eligibility pathway two. We have a certificate of graduate study. That's our CGS in English as a second language, 15 credits. And we have the details on the next slide. So uh, you heard Aaron talk about the methods and the linguistics and the curriculum of assessment. So the first three courses in this um, CGS in TESOL are uh, EDU 560, Methods and Approaches, and the next is Linguistics, and the, uh, the third is Curriculum and Assessment. And then there are choices. So there's another methods course for teaching reading and writing. There is the diversity course, Linguistic and Cultural Diversity in the Classroom. There's EDU 563, which goes deeper into testing and assessment. And then there's EDU, five, I've got to move that over, 567, uh, and that's theories of second language acquisition. So that's pathway two. And then pathway three is, that's 30 credits, and that's our master's degree program in advanced teacher certification. 
Um, and so that is online, um, as Andrea mentioned, those are seven week asynchronous courses, or we also have a blended option. And then if you'd like to go to the next one, Melanie. Thank you. And so uh, pathway four is world languages. So if you already have a certificate in world languages, that's six credits, and that would be EDU 561 and EDU 560. So linguistics and then the methods course. Okay, and then the conditional certificate for this endorsement uh, could be the master's degree program again, 30 credits online or blended. And I don't know if we have one more slide. Nope. Other than having our contact information. Thank you, Melanie. Couldn't find the mute button. Uh, no, thank you very much. Um, we would like to open up the floor. If anybody has questions, you are please welcome to come off mic, introduce yourself. Um, I also would encourage those that are here to, if you have questions and you don't want to ask in a public format, you can also do that through our feedback forum, which I will also link in the chat. And you can ask questions there from any of the offices um, or one office specifically. And what I'm going to do is bulk all of those questions. Um, please add your contact to it and then send it off to the respected offices as well. You can also take a screenshot of this or I will also send this out today um, as, a, as a PDF with the slides on it. Here are some of your contacts um, from today's call. And so if you have a question, please feel free to come off mic and ask it.